Now, I always ask before I start, do you have any questions? Because somebody always does, and they, then they go away, and the question wasn't answered, and I don't want that. So who's got a question? Anybody? Yes. So um, what does it mean on the screen, the soft side of a mean dinosaur? OK, you've asked the question, what does soft side of a mean dinosaur mean? Great question. This is Nano Tyrannus. Have you heard about Nano Tyrannus? You hear the word Tyrannus in his name, right? Nano Tyrannus. Does that make you think about another dinosaur? Which one? The Tyrannosaurus. T-Rex, yeah. And so they named him Nano Tyrannus because they think he's a juvenile. What does juvenile mean? Like a small. Young, yeah. They think he's a juvenile or young T-Rex, but he has differences. First of all, his jaws and teeth are much different. He has a different number of teeth, and his teeth have a little different curvature and size compared to T-Rex. So the teeth have been well studied, the hips have been looked at, and these hips are different from T-Rex. They think this guy could run 60 miles an hour, but chew you like a T-Rex. Now remember that scene in Jurassic Park when the mirror said, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Remember that? This guy would have eaten your mirror already before you got to see that. Yeah, that's how fast he was. So that's the mean side. Would you agree? What about the soft side? We're going to talk about his soft tissues. This is just now going to publication. We have a brand new paper coming out on Nano Tyrannus. We chose him because he is controversial. Everybody's already talking about Nano Tyrannus. Why not go look for Nano Tyrannus? And the Lord showed up. We went looking, we found him, we found his claws, we found his teeth and other bones. This is like bones in a cement mixer. So you don't walk up with a paintbrush and paint, you know, uh, wipe away the sand and there it's all laid out. Mm -mm, no, it's a jumble. It's like the mud was rolling under the water, carrying all these bones with it. And then the water ran off and there they are. That's what it looks like to me. But they're full of soft tissue. <laughs> so that's what I want to show you tonight, are the soft tissues that we're finding in these guys. Did I answer your question? OK. Any more questions before we get going? Yes? Has there ever been a study for like a human being that has passed away for like 100, and 100 years ago? Have they found any the same um, structures? Great question, and I have an answer for you. I'm not sure that that slide is in this presentation, but yes, they found an ice man. The Tyrolean, you can go home and Google it, T-Y-R-O-L-E-A-N, Tyrolean ice man. And the reason I got interested in it, because not only are there soft tissues, but there are soft nerves, and they cross-section them, and I can see all the layers in the nerve that I'm used to seeing. And they say, that guy is 5,000 years old. I'm like, well, OK. Ding, ding, ding. Maybe these guys are dated about the same age. Maybe that was all one big event, right? And that's where we're finding these, these fossils that we find, like this Nanotyrannus, uh, aged at 68 million years, are found all around the world. <clears throat> Pardon me, there's a layer called the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous goes all the way around the world. How cool is that? Now we can dig where? All the way around the world. And we're hoping to find soft tissue in this contiguous layer. But that means this was global. This was a global event. And it was a flood event, event because, well, you're just going to have to wait. I got proof for that. I can prove to you, to you that these guys died by asphyxiation in water. You ready to hear that tonight? Have you heard that? Raise your hand if you heard that before. OK, I got a good audience here. You got a lot of folks you're going to hear for the first time about blood clots. We'll get there. OK, any more questions before I carry on here? Good questions, class. I love it. That's what this is about. So just a little bit about us. Our mission is to locate and characterize. What does that mean? Understand as much DST, dinosaur soft tissue, as we can find. We want to show that this is prevalent. This is ubiquitous. This is abundant. And it is. 
We find it at every dig we go to. We want to find as many different types of dinosaurs, so taxa and depositional environments. People talk about, well, are, is one environment more special than another for saving these bones, for preserving this stuff? Do sandy soils, are they better than mudstones or sandstones? Or We really don't know, to be honest with you. And we find a lot of chaos even in the areas that we dig in. So there's a lot of work to be done and we need help. So come and join us. We want to publish every finding and we're publishing in secular journals. I think this is important. And we're being recognized, for example, on the nerve paper, and hopefully I'll show you this tonight. My brain kind of goes fuzzy after a while. But you'll see the nerve paper, they put that on the cover of the journal. I was blown away when we saw that. So we also want to give everything away and, and provide free copies. So we just ordered 2,500 more books. We'll keep ordering books 2,500 at a clip to give them away as long as you guys want them. So if you want books, we will ship you books for free. You just got to promise to give them away. I don't want to drive up to your house and see them in your garage, OK? That's not what these are for. So, but take them. If you will give them away, we will give them to you, no charge. So that's what we do. By the way, you can help us just by shopping on Amazon, as we all do, right? If you haven't already, you can sign up on smile.amazon. That's their charity. Uh, side and they will give us money. They, they, they're not giving us your money, they're giving us their money. So um, you can contribute by making your purchases through smile.amazon. So just tell them Distri, <clears throat> pardon me, we want Distri to be our uh, charity of choice because we're 501c3 and you can do that and that, that's a helpful thing. Okay, all right, little birdie told me, you know who you are birdie, you're in here, I won't point the laser at you. But she said, oops, I gave it away. She said, look, I have to do more Q&A than a typical seminar in Minnesota because Minnesotans don't ask a lot of questions and they don't answer a lot of questions. It's going to be hard to be like pulling chicken teeth to get them to answer questions. And so I have to both ask and answer the question. Am I wrong? No. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to do that, but I love to open with questions because that's important. So if you've got questions, you guys can interrupt me. All right? I don't want you to think that you can't. This is for you. This is not for me. But I want to be sure that I answer all questions. So if I don't, um, you know, interrupt me, but I'll be around afterwards. But at the end, and I'll try not to go too late. Can I go two hours tonight? Is that? When you guys start yawning, well, I'll make you stand up, and then we'll go a little more. But I'll be sensitive. Okay, so I want your questions answered, so don't feel like your question is not important. Let's take a minute and talk about bone. Bone, your bone, if I would borrow one of your digits, if you ever want to loan me a digit, I'll, I'll take it. Dinosaur digits are hard to come by, but your digits, man, there's lots of them. If I take a femur or a humerus, you know, these long bones in your body, <clears throat> humerus, femur, and I cut out a little section and enlarge it. This is what it looks like. And I hope I'm not blocking people. Well, will it make noise if I come over here? Good. So look at this block of tissue. That, that is tissue. Bone is tissue. It's considered soft tissue, actually, in the medical literature. So even though it's hard, it has a mineral component, but it's mostly collagen. And ladies, we know what collagen is, don't we? <laughs> the good and the bad. Uh, but it, it's all these collagen fibers in, in there, and they, they line up. You can't see it real well on this diagram, but you can see lines going this way and lines going this way and lines going that way. Those are the collagen fibers. So what the animal does first, what your bone does first every day is it lays down a carpet of collagen. And then the cells crawl out on that carpet, and they line up like little soldiers on parade. Did you know that? That's how your bone starts, a carpet of collagen. And those bone cells are laying there. What's a bone cell? That's a bone cell. See the bone cell? He's got a body, and then he's got these little legs. See all these? Some of the legs, look at that. They dig through the bone. You see that? You see this leg dive through the bone here and come out here? 
So they surround themselves in bone. They're completely encased in bone. And there they are for the rest of your life. These live throughout your life cycle. So they're very long lasting cells. And they're all touching each other. They all touch each other. In fact, when you're running or walking or carrying a heavy box, they're measuring the compression in your bone in real time. They have mechano sensors, they call them. And they measure, why? Why do you think they want to measure compression in your bone? So that way you know that you aren't carrying too much. Yeah, you can find out real fast with that. I have a bulging disc now from that very reason. And that's why I sit down a lot, because I'm in pain. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, they're measuring that compression because there could be problems. They're looking for cracks in your bone, these little cells. Because when they find a crack, they actually talk to other cells and cells called osteoclasts and osteoblasts go crawling in there. And they dissolve bone. One of them's like a little excavator, just carves out bone. And the other one comes in and just fills in that bone. Just like a, a pavement or a slab like this. And they do that constantly throughout your whole life cycle. So these are really important little cells. And we find lots of these, lots of them. And you'll get to see those if you come to the lab. You're going to see those with your own eyes through the microscope. So these bone cells are all in there. And they're laying down this collagen fiber, or carpet. They lay on it. Then they cover everything in bone. And they do it in cylinders. See these cylinders that are climbing up? This one here, this one here. And you can see the holes in them. Each of those holes is a bone canal. A bone canal. So there's canals in the bone. Question? Is this all part of DNA? The DNA is in the cell. So it's real tiny. It's way inside that cell, and it's very, very tiny. Is that where the different DNA comes from? DNA, uh, well, your cells are different uh, from dinosaur bone cells. So you have DNA that makes you. They have DNA that makes them. So it's different. The DNA is different. Yeah. Um, but great question. Thank you. So there's these canals. But think of a pyramid. Think of a pyramid in ancient Egypt with these scary little tunnels in them. There's one goes up that way. One goes over that way. One goes down there. I better take a lamp with me. And you're crawling through these tunnels, and you're looking for treasure. Same idea. What's the treasure we're looking for? Cells, nerves, is that what you're going to say? Yeah, soft tissue, right? And these are the treasures we're finding. So it's really, it's hard, but it's soft. It's considered soft tissue, but it's hard. But in these canals are three colored things. You see the three colors? What are the three colors? Can't hear you. Red. It's almost like white. It's, it looks like white, doesn't it? It's actually yellow. What's the other color? Blue. Blue, red, and yellow, actually. The blue is what? The vein. The red is the artery. What's the yellow? Yeah, that's a nerve. Now, when we read the literature, we thought, OK, they're finding blood vessels. They're not finding veins. We found veins. I think I have a picture for you. So we were the first ones to find veins. And we thought, they're not finding nerves. They're if there are vessels there and there are veins there, there have to be nerves there. And yeah, they're there. We found them. So what else can I tell you about this? Any questions so far? Yeah. So when you have like those little things connecting, are they, is that like, so there's like always like cracks forming in our bones that they get fixed really quickly? So even not stressing or anything, there's always the same cracks in our bones? They do it all through chemistry somehow. Because they're all connected. These, these cells can't move around, can they? They're all touching each other. So when you strip away that bone, you see this 3D network of cells all interconnected. So they can't move around, but they send out signals, and that calls out the other cells. And they come and do the work. So it's, it's fascinating, and it's automatic, which is what blows me away. It's self-replicating, and it's automatic. If that doesn't scream design, I don't know what does. What do these little guys look like? Well, here's what they look like in the microscope. You see this nice little body. And look at all these little fingers coming off of there. Tiny little fingers. Some of them we see nuclei in. We see other organelles. You have organs. Cells have organelles. Okay? So they have organelles in here. But all these little thread feet. Now, these are very tiny. 
these little thread feet. By the way, this should all be dust. This should be dust by now. Why? 68 million years old and it still looks like this? Come on. I did a conference in Hartford, Connecticut at the microscopy site of America meeting. I don't know what year it was. But I presented these cells that I started finding. <clears throat> at the end of my talk, uh, a professor, a female professor, PhD at a major university, jumped out of her chair and came straight at me saying in a loud voice, your cells look alive, I have to work with you. And I thought, wow, thank you, Lord. Somebody wants to work with me. And then somebody said to her, he's a creationist. And that was the end of that. <laughs> but look at the reaction. You see, these cells do look alive. And, and I, I cannot figure out why they're alive. Because I, my career was as a soft tissue processing expert. What does that mean? I worked in university lab, laboratories, and I was trained to handle tissues, plant tissue, animal tissue, even jellyfish eyes. One day, a professor walked in with fresh jellyfish eyes from the Indonesian islands, and I had to process those. They were mostly water, but I got them processed, and I have them. I have still some of those samples. So I know how to process very delicate tissues. There's no preservation mechanism for this. First of all, these cells, anybody know what kind of a, of a they don't have a wall, they have a, uh, a membrane, right? Plant cells have walls, right, students? Yeah, they're kind of rigid. Animal cells have a membrane. Anybody know what it's called? Phospholipid, lipid, lipid. What's a lipid? Fat. <laughs> I love, I told Ruth, I love to say fat, because everybody jumps when I say it, me included. <laughs> These cells are made of fat. And so how can that still be here if it's 68 million years old? These are impossible tissues. They should be dust. This should be dust by now. But they're not, and they have internal organs. Now, I'll go further, and I will point out to you that another researcher, Dr. Schweitzer, who's at North Carolina State University, found inside the nucleus what are called histones. What's a histone? That's a DNA wrapping protein. It was still intact. Because your DNA is so long, it has to be wrapped up and wrapped up and wrapped up and wrapped up into those little X's and Y's, right? If you stretch out a DNA molecule, it's six feet tall. But that's got to fit inside your nucleus. How do they do that? Well, the Lord designed these little proteins that wrap them and wrap them and wrap them. She found those. And she found others that are equally as shocking in the cells from the T-Rex that she's been working with. So, Dr. Schweitzer nailed it out of the solar system. This is definitely dinosaur tissue. There's no doubt about it. She proved it over and over with this test and that test and the other test. There's no question now, but she had a problem. She painted herself in the corner. Why? They're supposed to be 68 million years old and there's no explanation. They can't be old. Can they? <clears throat> Lipids, if you take a bottle of Wesson oil and paint, point it, pour it out in your backyard, you know, mark it with a little picket fence so you know where it is, put a sign in there, do not disturb, and pour that whole bottle of Wesson oil right there on that dirt and come back in four months, five months, six months and tell me how much oil you're going to find in the ground still. Would you expect to find it? No, why? All those microorganisms are chewing away at that stuff. We found the DNA of 30 some different organisms in that horn, including rodents. We found rodent hair in the horn. Everything's trying to get at that stuff. <clears throat> the latest discovery we've made is we found roundworms in these bones, living, living roundworms. <laughs> There are more in the bone, a study showed, than in the soil around the bone. Why? Because there's food in the bones. That's why. These can't be old. Things are still eating at it. Right? So erase that 68 million dollars off the white, uh, 68 million years off the whiteboard. Send me the 68 million. I could use it. <laughs> but erase that off the board because deep time doesn't exist now. So guess what? 
If you're arguing with somebody about this, stop it. Stop. First of all, you're not supposed to be arguing anyway, are you? No. Read the Sermon on the Mount, right? We gotta be mournful in spirit, lowly in spirit, humble, right? Uh, desiring truth, desiring peace with others. Peacemakers, he says. So, no, you shouldn't be arguing. You should be testifying. And so that's why we bring this information to you, so you can learn it and understand it and use it to testify. So, not many cells should be there in terms of size. Let me give you an idea of size. If you divide your hair, let's say you pluck one of your hairs, and you, do, you, know, you want to know the size of the cross section, the length of the cross section, that's 100 microns typically. What's that? That's 10 to the minus 6 meters. You really needed to know that, didn't you? It's a really, really small number. Uh, if you divide that one, okay, let me start over. So the hair is 100 microns wide, 100, picture 100 slices across that hair, each one equal. That's 100 slices. Take one of those slices, divide that into 1,000. You with me? 1,000 slices, then take 200 of those. That's the width of that little leg coming off that cell. How can that be there, that tiny, that tiny, in the ground? Even for 6,000 years, 4,000 years, how can that be there? I don't know. You know what? No, nobody else does either. They, they came up with an idea called the iron preservation theory, but it doesn't work. Most of all, it eats fats, so the nerves wouldn't be there, the lipids wouldn't be there, and these cells wouldn't be there, because iron eats the fat. Look at these cells. This is under my electron microscope. So, and we're collecting them from everything. This is Nanotyrannus vertebra. I think the previous one was what? That's Triceratops, that's the horn. That guy right there produced those cells right there. Right? That's Nanotyrannus. Here's this, this marker. So that's one tenth of one of your hairs. See that? The length of this line is one-tenth the diameter of one of your hairs. And look at how tiny that cell is. So, these are really small and they shouldn't be there. <laughs> they should all be dust. This one is a really important picture because we did this in a very special electron microscope. Normally we have to cover or coat all of our specimens in metal. Well, how do you do that? It's a lengthy process. I'll tell you, but we sputter coat, we evaporate metal atoms over the surface and put a metal coating. Because when you put it in an electron microscope, you're not using light, you're not using this, you're using electrons. You ever lick your finger and stick it in a socket? Uh, don't do that, by the way. I did it and I'm still paying for it. But all that electricity will go through your finger and into your body. And so, that can be harmful when you're looking at soft tissues. So they developed a new microscope where you don't have to coat it in metal. Now you're looking at the actual cell surface. That's what it looks like in this microscope. That's as real as it gets. And look at how tiny some of these little philopodia are. So this was published in Microscopy Today, a secular journal. We do all our publications in secular journals. Here's the veins I told you about. You might, you might be wondering, so what? I was trained to do this, right, Julie? <laughs> you might be wondering, so what? This stuff should be dust by now. It's so fragile. It's so, it's like a micron thin, and it's still here. And Dr. Schweitzer observed these with red blood cells still inside of them. I haven't found those yet, but she's got the million dollar lab and the 10 technicians and the $150,000 a year salary for, the, for her, and the $200,000 a year for the technicians, and you, hear, you get me, right? Yes, sir. Uh, my question is, um, so it makes sense that it should be there after 6 to 8 billion years, but I'm curious why, is there a reason it should be there after 4,000 years? Great question. Why is it here still after 4,000 years? Exactly. It's, I can't answer it, but, I can say a couple of things. Um, 
First of all, God bragged about dinosaur bones in the Bible. Didn't he? You've read in Job. He talked about, aren't there bones like brass? He bragged about that. Have you considered this stuff, right, is what he's saying. So I think that's kind of a clue that maybe he made these a little different because, you know, the Bible says you are dust, and the dust you will return. We don't find a lot of human skeletons, and don't think they haven't looked. If you take all the human skeletons that have ever been found, they'll probably fit into one casket alone. So there's tons more dinosaurs, and they persist. So I don't know. People get upset with me when I say, well, God is preserving them. Well, that's not a scientific explanation. Then I say, okay, then you give me one, because I can't, as a soft tissue processing expert, that's what I do for a living, I don't know. Because I was taught to process tissues on ice, and all my solutions had to be on ice, ice cold. Why? Everything breaks down, Mark. You gotta walk that, all your solutions have to be frozen, four degrees centigrade, and you gotta walk them through these solutions as you process that tissue. That's how I was trained. Because this stuff breaks down right away. There's a process called autolysis. Maybe you've heard of it. Auto meaning self, autolysis meaning breaking apart. Your cells are programmed to break apart at death or if they're necrotic. That's programmed into your cell, autolysis. Mary Schweitzer herself asked, why are these cells here if autolysis is working? The other thing is hydrolysis, water breaking down. Everything breaks down in water. <clears throat> if you don't believe me, fill your sink full of water and put a dead fish in there for a week. You'll see how badly and disgustingly, grotesquely, it breaks down. It does. And, and we're learning a lot from forensic scientists who study the way bodies decay. They know about bone decay. They know all these things. And they're going, yeah, 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 wow, we see what you're doing. So did I answer your question? Yeah. OK. I mean, I want to. That's what this is all about. It's not about hearing me bang my gums together. It's about you guys getting the answers you need. Yes, ma'am. Okay, how do these tissues compare with mummified? I think these are mummified. Uh, mummification is mostly desiccation, just drying things out, right? And sometimes if you rehydrate tissues, they will take up that water again. So I think these are mummified, um, but they're covered in fat, so they're kind of protected too, aren't they? Because they're covered in fat. So we have a lot to learn. We, I, I guess a lot of times I could just sit here and say, I don't know. But that wouldn't be a fun evening, wouldn't it? So, yes, sir? From Egyptian mummification, have they found fat? Yeah, there are lipids. In fact, uh, that guy, the Tyrellian Iceman, was mummified. Uh, his body was completely desiccated. He wasn't wrapped, of course. But they did a cross-section of the nerve, and they saw all the fat in there, still in that 5,000-year-old thing. So, yeah. The, I know of no preservation mechanism, I'll put it that way. And if I don't know, I mean, may, there are smarter people, there's no question, than myself in this field. Uh, but I haven't read any other explanation so far but the iron preservation theory. So, yes? Did they find any King Tut's body? I'm sorry, say again? Did they find any King Tut's body? Oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you, you should study that and come back and do a lecture yourself, yeah? Good question. OK, now here's a magnification of the previous cell. Wait, I'd shown you that cell here. So we went up really high. This is, uh, how high is this? Uh, da -da 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 -da. Well, there's a micron bar. This is 2,500 2, power. And there's one little philopodia coming down here. And there's no marks or defects or problems with it. So if iron had flowed through here, and that's the point we made in the article, this would not be there. The iron would have chewed it up. So they're publishing just about everything we show them. All right, everybody stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stretch, stretch, shake your booty. All right, have a seat. Feel better? Yeah? All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, I've been asked, what is the iron preservation theory? Great question. Because there is no preservation mechanism that we know of to account for the presence of these tissues, 
um, an explanation had to be brought forward. And one that was offered was that the iron that's in the hemoglobin, that's in the red blood cell, um, is responsible. Somehow, all those cells ruptured, all the blood cells ruptured on death. We know that's not true. I'll explain that in a second. And that iron somehow got out of the hemoglobin molecule, which it's really difficult chemically. That's so bound up in there. It's a biological ferritin. And it's so hard to take that out of there. So, but this is the theory. <clears throat> that iron got free of the hemoglobin. It leaked out into the bone. And it preserved all the tissues in its path, including the cells, which are covered in what class? Fat, yeah, lipid, yeah. <laughs> and so that was the explanation offered. The iron somehow confers, <clears throat> confers a resistance to the collagen, the elastin, and other proteins in the vessel. Now, they only talked about blood vessels for the iron preservation theory. So they haven't addressed cells, they haven't addressed nerves, they haven't addressed veins, which you saw. They only focus on blood vessels. Now, blood vessels are made of woven fibers, mostly collagen, elastin, things like that. And so they studied those bonds, the very tight bonds between those chemicals and iron, and they found a little stiffening in the bond. That's the actual science they did. They used a very expensive machine to look at the atomic bonds between these proteins and iron. And they said they look a little stiffer. So they said iron stiffens it and confers a resistance over deep time. How long did they do the experiment? This many years. Two years. They put it on a laboratory bench in an air-conditioned laboratory. They took ostrich vessels, emu vessels, took them out of those birds. They took blood from chickens and emus. The first thing they did is they put an anticoagulant in the blood. Now wait a minute, we're talking about dinosaurs at Hell Creek and suddenly we're talking about an anticoagulant. Why, pray tell, do you need the anticoagulant? Because the blood can't clot. Well, what does blood do when it comes out of a vessel, folks? It clots. That's what it does. When you get a cut in your vessel, signals are sent to other proteins in your bloodstream, and they start making a clot. It's called the, the cascade. It's a clotting cascade. So the first thing they did was put a chemical in there that prevented it from clotting. Well, that's not an accurate experiment. They would accuse me of who knows what if I did that. But that was step one. What was step two? Let's centrifuge it at 60,000 RPM and take all the cells out. Cells? Yeah, you got white cells, you got platelets, other tiny cells in the blood. Let's take all those out of there. Now, do you think that also happened in Hell Creek? Did they line up before their death to get an anticoagulant shot and then they said, here, centrifuge all my blood, please? Folks, this is what they do, and they call it a representative example of what happened at Elk Creek. Come on. So that's how they did that. And they did more. They used molecular filters to filter out the clotting factors. OK, if you don't understand clotting factors, Google it on, or go to Wikipedia. It's like six pages. Knock yourself out. It's so complex. I, I don't begin to understand it. So, no, I don't think those conditions are indicative of what happened to these animals, which were buried in a rolling mud that must have rolled under a lot of water, like a cement mixer underwater, tearing these things limb from limb. Most of the bones we find are torn up like that and broken, sh you know, shattered. We talk about this in our papers. So that's the iron preservation theory in a nutshell. And I'm going to show you right now how our results show that that's impossible. Any other questions on the iron preservation theory? Think of it this way. You know what happens to a steel bumper in Minneapolis in the middle of the winter, 
right? Or anything that's in your yard that's made of steel. You know what happens to that, which is? Okay. It rusts, right? You see that rust chewing away at the metal. What is that? That's iron and oxygen and water. That's what that is. Have you got oxygen here in Minnesota? I, I think you do, because I think I've been breathing okay. Have you got water here in Minnesota? I see a lot of lakes, so it obviously rains and snows a lot here. You have steel here in Minnesota? Yeah, all it takes is those three things and that iron starts to eat everything around it. What is that gonna to do to your blood if it can chew up metal? So I would just ask you to think about rust, but, but let's talk about the science of this. So this is what we call a thin section. So we take these bones and we cut off a chunk and then we thin that chunk down to about half the width of one of your hairs about 40 microns, and then we put it under the microscope. And so here's a chunk of Triceratops horn bone, and look how brown it is. See all the dark brown color? It's like a piece of toast that you get out of the toaster. You, you know, you're, you're turning that brown in a short period of time, right? Why? You're applying a lot of heat to it rapidly. That's how you make your toast. So these things toast, but they toast over a long time. So maybe they've been in the ground 4,000 years, 6,000 years, I don't know. Can you hang on for just a second and let me, so I just want to show you this because it's so important. So the, the bone turns kind of brown, but what's all this black stuff? You know what all this black stuff is? Anybody know what that is? Yeah. There's, there's a lot of black stuff. Look at it all up here. You know, some of these canals, that, these are canals, the open spaces, that's a bone canal. So in there would have been a blood vessel, a blood vein, and a nerve, right? They would have been traveling through there but there's all this dark stuff. Well, let's magnify like this guy right here. Let's just look that, at that at a little higher magnification. And here it is, here's the bone canal, but what is all this? What is all that? Well, we thought, okay, they talk in the literature about how this is sand and sediment that infilled into the bone. You know, the water brought the sand in there. We thought, okay, well, if that's the case, we should see all kinds of little different colored crystals in there. We don't see that at all. Oh well, I shouldn't say that. In some bones they are sand infilled, but not in these bones, not in the bones we've been looking at. So that's something dark. There's just a little bit of hole in it, so it kind of fills almost the whole canal, right? And it doesn't go past a certain point. You see that? It stays inside this circle. What's that circle? That's the bone canal wall. So that is the entire opening of the bone canal filled with something black, right? What could that be? Here's another one right next to it. All these little dots here, what are those? Those are the bone cells. All the lines you see in there, see the lines? That's all collagen fibers. Remember, we talked about that. So you're seeing everything in the bone that you saw in the diagram. Now, there's a property of iron, because we thought, well, these, what if this is iron? What if this is the clot? What if this is clotted blood? How would we know that? How would we, well, you could test it chemically, but these are really small, so you gotta have tiny instruments, really expensive machines. I don't got that. What do I have? I got microscopes, and I got microscopes that operate at different wavelengths. You know the rainbow, right? I can, I can make my microscope make pink color, or blue color, or red color. So I can examine things under different wavelengths. I do that with this clot, because I know it's a clot now, and I'm going to show you why. Iron has a property. It reacts to a certain wavelength of light, ultraviolet. Now that's damaging for our eyes, right? We don't want to look at ultraviolet light. So I wear these orange glasses, real thick, so they don't hurt my eyes. But I hit this with very high intensity UV light, and look at what it does. It lights up like a little lighthouse. Look at that. That's only UV light hitting that. And so it's returning a signal and it's saying, I'm iron, I'm iron, I'm iron. And look, I don't go th past this sharp line. Look at that sharp line. If this is leaking out into the bone, why don't I see it leaking into the bone? I don't. The clots, and so we know these are clots, <laughs> We had an ER physician look at some of our pictures and he noted 
some of these are, are crystallized proteins. So I can recognize them for the proteins that they are based on their shape. So this is definitely clotted blood and it stayed in the canal. So if iron is preserving the tissues out in the bone, you know, it's still, how did it do it? Did it reach out from the canal and say, you're preserved? No, it's stuck in the canal, yeah? And we have found this over and over and over and over and over again. We've looked at seven different individuals from, from about 2,500 miles in diameter, and they're all clotted. We look in the literature and we look at all the other papers, because we have to read those papers, and those papers we have to reference in our work. So we have to know everybody else's work before we can present our own, yeah? And so we've done that. And we see in their pictures, in their publications, clots everywhere, and they don't even know they're there. So we've challenged them. The latest paper that's going to be in the November issue says, hey, you guys, fellow workers in this, in this field of study, why don't you bring us your bone slides and let us verify for you that these are clots or do it yourself. So we've kind of laid down a challenge there. This is huge. Clots in these bones means they drown. There's a condition, a medical condition, it's called disseminated intravascular coagulation. I invent you, I invite you to repeat that if you can. It took me a long time to do that. Intravascular coagulation, but it's disseminated. Intravascular means inside the vascular system. Coagulation, you know what that is. That's clotting, disseminated. Do you know that people who died from COVID literally drowned to death and their bones have clots in them? Yeah. When you come into the ER as a drowning victim and they cannot resuscitate you, the clots that formed in your body will stay there until you rot. But they'll stay in your bones. We have not been able to dislodge these from the bone. And we use high-speed diamond saws to grind this and cut these. And they're still not dislodged. So I don't know. You tell me. We're finding clots in every individual we find, which shows that they drown in water. Now, what does that sound like? Yeah, and it's global. So what does that sound like? Yeah. The flood. The flood is real. The flood is real. It's a real judgment. It really happened. And I've got rock solid evidence here, and I'll show this to anybody. A lot of people ask me, well, how do they all react to you? Most of them are pretty quiet. Thank God there are a few who are looking at it and going, okay, Mark, let's work together. And we're building relationships. Because that's what this is about. This is for all men and women to know. Dinosaur soft tissue being soft proves that the bones are soft. It proves that the layers are, are young. I'm sorry. Proves that the bones are young. It proves that the layers are young. Hey, this is my third talk in a row today, so I'm having a tough time. <laughs> it shows that the layers are young. If the layers are young and it goes all around the earth, the earth is young. That means Adam and Eve were real. The garden was real. If the flood is real, that means the coming judgment is real. And, you know, we look at our society right now and wonder what is going on. What if we're in the end times right now? Are you ready to go through them? Pulling people out of the fire? This morning we studied Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, right? We heard that this morning. The three of them went into the furnace, but there was a fourth one there. The king wanted to know, who's that fourth person? And that was God, and he started worshiping God from that time forward. We need to counsel people, it's time for you to worship God and bow down before him and ask him to have mercy on you, a sinner. Have mercy on me, Jesus, a sinner. That's what we need to be telling all of our friends and folks that we don't consider friends. They are your brother in Adam, aren't they? They are your sister in Eve, aren't they? You know, how's your golden rule? If, if you realize that there's one race, there are not races, there's one race of people. And this town has is, is really had a hard time with that, right? This is a great message for this town. You're my brother, you're my sister in Adam. How is your golden rule of practice gonna change when you start understanding 
that we are all brothers and sisters in Adam and Eve. Maybe not in Christ yet, that's the goal, but certainly in Adam and Eve, and this stuff proves it. So that's why we're out here showing you guys that these, these demarcation lines, they're really sharp. This does not cross into the bone, it stays in the canal. You can see the clot going all the way down. This is all plastic. We put these in plastic and then we thin them out. So all the clear stuff you see, that's plastic. So you're looking down the plastic in this thin section and you see the clot just going all the way down the wall. Now we've also found roundworms, tons of roundworms living in here. Why are they living in there? There's more of them in the bone than in the soil. Why? They're full of food, the soft tissue. So this is all published. This is all in the open literature. Nano Tyrannus, this is the guy that's about to be published. We, we set several bones in for thin sectioning. <clears throat> Here's the vertebra. And these are, like I said, hair thin or less. But the clots show, show up really beautifully. Look at that clot. I took the color out and look at that. Look at that iron in there. That's all iron. And this is all clotted, I'm sorry, crystallized blood products in here. So we know we have blood in the canals. We know that they're in individual after individual after individual. Camerosaurus, this guy's 90 feet long. If you go to Vernal, Utah, you can go to the field house observatory there, the lab there, it's called the field house, Utah field house, and they have a Camerosaurus. It fills this room. It's about the size of this room. <laughs> And you can look at all its bones from tip of the tail to the snout, full of clots. And this was in, this was in Colorado, so pretty far from Montana. But you have a clot here, and it's extending into this canal, and you have a clot over here. Here's the blood canal. This is a Volksmann canal. But look at all this tiny stuff. What is that? You know, Mary Schweitzer wrote in Discover Magazine, I found red, wet, red blood cells inside of canals like this in her preparations. She saw actual red blood cells. Her professor said, prove to me that these are not. Did she prove it? No, she couldn't prove it. She couldn't prove that they were not red blood cells. So we know people are seeing this, but here's a clot in camera source. Here it is in the UV. That's supposed to be 145 million years old. So. It doesn't depend, I mean, it doesn't matter where we dig. We've dug in the Permian. Anybody know how old the Permian is supposed to be? Yeah? Actually, 290. Wait, but the world's only 65 million years old. How is that? Well, the Earth isn't that old. But no, according to their uh, chart, their schema, we had a good sermon about that, didn't we? Schema. I have to remember that. We had a really good sermon because Satan uses schemes and God uses form. Look up those two words. It's really, we heard a really good sermon about that. Anyway, according to their schema, this animal is 145 million years old. And yet it has clots. So we've seen clots in 68 million, Nanotyrannus, 145 million. But Dimetrodon, do I have Dimetrodon in here? I'm not sure I do. But these bones right down here, we set these in for thin sectioning. We also have a tooth here. You can come up and look at this tooth. We thin section one of the teeth, and this guy here, clots, full of clots, 290 million years old. Why? Same event. So the ages are the same event according to the rocks, but they're different ages according to the geologists. So who are you going to believe? And they, they won't talk about a lot of this stuff. They kind of ignore it. But that's OK. You know what? Behind every person who stands up against this, there are 10 people who want to hear this. There are 10 people. Those are the folks I want to reach. So I, I often tell these geologists, you're not my target audience. They kind of get bristled at that. But you know what? That's the truth. My target audience is honest, open people who want to know the truth and really want a relationship with God. That's who I want to reach. So, all right, we talked about bone already, but we didn't really talk about nerves. I mentioned them. So let me show you the work we did with nerves. Now, class, birds came from where, according to the evolutionists? Yes. Actually, they say they came from dinosaurs. That's a good answer. But they say that birds descended from dinosaurs. That's what they're saying now. So when you go into college, 
That's what you're going to learn, that birds are descendants of dinosaurs. Okay? So we thought, okay, we'll look at birds first, since they're related. And so we took a chicken from the store, and I took a chicken leg from the store, and I removed the sciatic nerve from it. This is a fun project, kids. You can do this, and mom shouldn't give you too hard of a time. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta make sure you package it all up in one bag and throw it away when you're done, and wash your hands. But this is a cross section now of a sciatic nerve. Okay, so the nerve is going into the board, but we cut it into a section. And I put it in a specific stain that turns lipids dark. And what you see here is an outer covering. This is called connective tissue. Look at how white it is. It's not taking up any of the stain, but all this stuff inside, there must be a lot of lipids in there. And there are. Okay. So this is what we started with. Now we peeled away most of this outer layer. By the way, this layer is called epidurium in the technical literature. That's the term they use for it. So epidurium is like an outer wrapping. Do you remember those, and I know we've all switched now to streaming and Wi-Fi and whatever, but back in the day, mom and dad will tell you, there were these wires called coaxial wires. Remember those folks? Remember that rubber wrapping? This is the rubber wrapping around that coaxial cable. Now, when you peeled that rubber wrapping away, you saw this crosshatch metal. Anybody ever seen that before? If you take the rubber wrapping off a coaxial cable, you've seen that. The next layer looks just like it. I'm going to show you. So we peeled away this outer epineurium and exposed this perineurium. See how much thinner that is? It was much thicker. But look at how much darker this is. Why? The stain is really staining the lipids now. So the, the lipids are getting really dark. This is the inner layer. And this has that crosshatch pattern, which you will see. These, actually, now we've peeled off that layer. And now we see in here these wavy bundles of axons. The axons are bound up in here, and they transmit the electrical cable. Now, the reason we cover electrical cables in rubber is so that we don't get shocked, right? These are covered in the same kind of fat to keep the body from getting shocked, because a lot of electricity goes through these. And so they have to be insulated. So that's what the chicken looks like. And you're going to see another picture of a chicken nerve in a second. But these are called the fascicles. Inside the fascicles, these little wavy things here are the axons. And the tr electricity is transmitted down these fibers inside the nerve. OK. We went to Montana. We dug in the place we had been digging, the famous Hell Creek area, and we found a condyle. This is that softball-shaped bone at the base of the skull, which lets the triceratops do this with the skull, right? It's a softball-shaped bone. Well, we dissolved this, and we found nerves in it. But again, we wanted to compare what we found to chickens and to what the literature says. So we looked in the literature, there was this drawing from 1943, which showed the crosshatch pattern in nerves. When we took a nerve out of a chicken bone, look at the crosshatch pattern. See it? See the crosshatch? And here's the fat layer. We thin sectioned this, so you're only seeing the edge of the fat layer. But look at that crosshatch. That means you have a nerve. So that's a chicken nerve. And we know, OK, now we know what they look like. We know what they look like in the literature. Let's look at what we had on the dinosaur. That's a dinosaur nerve from that condyle. It looks brown. Remember that bone I showed you that turned brown? They kind of brown with age. But it has the same crosshatch pattern in here as the chicken nerve. Does that mean the one descended from the other? No. It means the creator used the same design for nerves in chickens and in you. I could have just as easily used one of your bones. And in dinosaur, it's the same design. And we showed, sorry? They both had toes. Both had toes, right? So we showed example after example. All this was published. Even the wrapping 
came off. See the twisted wrapping, that double helix wrapping that gives it that crosshatch shape? See the crosshatch in there? That's a nerve. That's a nerve. We also thin sectioned it. We took one nerve and we cut it and cut it and cut it. There is a fascicle inside that. Look at all that fat. That's a fat layer. That's the fascicle inside. That's where the electricity passes. So we showed them conclusively that we have found nerves for the first time. Anybody, anywhere, first time on Earth found nerves in dinosaurs. And what did they do? They threw us out? No. They put us on the cover of the journal. Wow. 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 That is so humbling for someone like me who just wants to publish and get this out there. So they're honoring our work. They're showing us that this is important. And uh, it's something now that you can take out and share with everybody. Not every single one. The, the ones that are permineralized, uh, which means they have kind of turned more to stone, and we do find uh, there, are, there are bones up here that are permineralized. So we do find them that are turned into stone. Those don't yield any soft tissue. It's all been mineralized. But when, when we thin section them, we see the clots. Um, but the percentage of bones that yield soft tissue is very high, 90, 95%. Um, we want to verify this. So we go on digs twice a year when I can do it, but certainly once a year, we invite you to come on a dig. Um, you'll have to pay the dig operator every day a little bit. Um, you'll have to cover your uh, travel and living, but we'll set you up. We'll show you where to be and we'll all dig together. You can take this stuff home. I'll show you how to process them and you can do it yourself. So it doesn't have to be me the only one doing this. Others can do it. I can show you how to do it. But no, it's, it's such a high percentage that it's, it's just, it's abundant. That's all I can say at this point. It's just abundant so far. Question here. Yes, sir. Does the, pre does the presence of soft tissue make it theoretically possible to go into the Great question. Does the presence of soft tissue make it theoretically possible to clone. Cloning is really difficult. Um, you remember Dolly, who they cloned, the, what they cloned. It was a sheep, right? So Dolly was cloned. That took uh, months and months and months. You need all the genetic material to be present uh, in order for that to take place. And you have to implant all that genetic material in a viable egg cell. And so, the egg cell is probably no problem in getting. It's the DNA from the dinosaur, and it's too labile. It's too fragile. A paper came out recently that said uh, the half-life of DNA, which would mean the time it takes for half of it to decay. So if you have a pound of DNA, half of it decays in what amount of time? That number was only 521 years. That's really fast. So it breaks down really, really fast. So I think the odds of finding viable DNA are probably very low. Maybe we'll find some genes and learn some stuff from that, but I don't think cloning, yeah. I think God's going to remake them, though, in the new heavens and new earth. So, you know, maybe I'm going to line up to brush their teeth with a big toothbrush, and maybe that'll be my job. I don't know. Good question. Yes. question is, uh, other scientists that I know, are they changing their views? Some of them, remarkably, are, uh, yeah, they seem to be. They seem to be open. And one of the things we're hoping to do is to produce a library of specimens, because institutions do this. They'll prepare a whole bunch of permanent specimens, like the bones, but also like the slides that we bring to the labs. That's a lending library. So we can collaborate with some of these researchers on other campuses, well, I don't have a campus, I wish I did, but on campus, and they can study this for themselves, and so that's one thing we're hoping to do, but it is refreshing because we're allowed to publish, we're allowed to present, we can go to some of these scientific meetings and talk to 500 PhDs, so we want to do more of that. 
The other thing we're trying to do, and you guys can help, is we feel that homeschool community is the best community right now for growth in this area. I think you guys are re more ready, more accepting, more understanding, uh, and more hungry for this kind of content. We'd love to take it to the secular schools, but they are really hesitant to let this into their school. We do try to speak on college campuses. So far we've been to uh, University of Texas, El Paso, Penn State, uh, Cal State Long Beach, USC. I got to speak at USC. And so we want to do more of that. So you can pray about all these issues, uh, the things that we're working on. But yeah, most of the scientific community seems to want to ignore this. This is a career killer. It killed my career when I got terminated. Nobody will hire me now. Uh, but that's OK. The Lord's taking care. So but does that help you? We, we do have some folks that are open, which is really exciting. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question because we're finding them in just about everything we look at. Uh, one of the things I did not talk about is some of the Permian nerves that we've been finding. I talked about Dimetrodon, but at the end of the table there are these tiny little black limb bones. Did you see those? Come up and look at those. Those are also Permian. The best nerves we've ever found, have ever found, come from those limb bones. And those are 230, 200, uh, I guess about 280 million, so according to their scheme. So my impression is the deeper we dig, the better the preservation. I'll give you a couple of other examples. I have a colleague in LA who's looking at Devonian and Carboniferous. There are fish bones throughout that coal, and they are excellently preserved. And the cross sections, the thin sections, are showing clots, cells, and maybe, uh, yeah, actually nerves. So he's got nerves in Devonian that he's hoping to publish. So, no, I think this whole thing was one big event. We've named it all kinds of names. Okay, I think it's the same event because the preservation gets better the deeper we go. So I'm trying to find if that's true or not. Come along and join us, yeah? I need you in the lab. I need people in the lab. So, yes, sir. Once I'm there, well, uh, I would say it would cost you for a week of digging, which is what you want to do, uh, probably twelve to fifteen hundred for the week. That's that's not terrible. Now, you're not in the Hilton at that point, okay? You're <laughs> you might be in a cabin on the ranch that has a lot of flies in it, and we've done that. And there's a lot of flies, a lot of flies. Did I tell you there's a lot of flies on the ranch? <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> you know, if you save a little more, you could stay at the Best Western around the corner. And so, but I think 1500 for a week and you'll have the time of your life. Can we go in an RV? Yeah, there's camping. So yes, you can go in an RV, come in an RV. So if you really want to come on a dig, contact me. Uh, the email is on the book, the back of the book. And send me an email by about January, and I will have details and can pass that along to you. Um, I will take your names and I'll give that to the operator so that with a group we can get a better price. They they like a group to come at one time because you know ten people paying eighty dollars is better than two people paying a hundred, right? So we can get the price down if we do that. So just I would say by January, let me know by email and yeah. Come along with us. So, so the fee of $100 is for the dig? Only? Yeah, the dig, you pay the dig operator directly for that. <clears throat> so at the end of the week, he'll tell you, okay, you were here four and a half days, and he charges you accordingly. So that's something you pay to him. If you take away teeth and claws, he'll probably charge you for those, because they sell those. They, they polish them up and put them on eBay, and they get an amazing amount of money for them. So, and that's their livelihood. A lot of these ranchers, they're Christians, they're homeschoolers, the ones we go to, and their cattle ranching days are pretty bad right now. So they depend on this for their bread and butter. So, uh, but we can get a better rate, and usually I can strong arm them a little bit and say, do you really want to charge her that much for that claw? And they say no, and you would get a better price. So, 
But we go as a team, and a, one of the things I expect you guys to do is do a little work for Distri. We need a lot of bones. Um, we have brought extra bones this trip to give to students. We don't normally do that because it takes a lot of bones to do that. But we want to give a real thrill here. So the students will go home with an actual dinosaur bone today that we've collected off these dig sites. And they probably have soft tissue in them. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Well, you got to know the dig operator. Everybody hear the question, how do you get access to the digs? Some are more expensive than others. Um, some yield better fossils. Um, the, the digs in Jordan have yielded the best cells I've ever seen, and I've never been able to go back. So I got to go there one time, collect as much as I could, and you know, I worked through all that stuff. So, but the best cells that I've ever seen came out of that dig. So. Some are better in terms of what they produce, in terms of the types they produce. Claws and teeth are predominant in Jordan, but not in Glendive. So it, it depends. <clears throat> Some of the operators um, you know, are more in a town. Glendive has you know, a bunch of restaurants and gas stations and you know, hotels, so the whole town is a little more expensive. Jordan, there's like one gas station, one grocery store, and the Main Street is four blocks long, so that's a cheaper dig. <laughs> but it just depends. Um, depends on how they're doing economically, too. If they're doing well, they don't charge as much, so there's a lot of factors. But yeah, we, we don't really know until we go, right? It's like you don't show up at Walmart, you don't know until you show up at Walmart how much the lettuce really is nowadays. Yeah? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah? Yes, sir. That's a great question. It has been uplifted. So normally it's a very deep dig, the Cretaceous, but for some reason the Lord lifted this one up all around the earth. So I would say in Montana, it's probably 500 to 1,000 feet deep, but other places of the world is more shallow, but they all apparently yield the same fossils. So it's a blessing. It's an incredible blessing. Great question. All right, any more? Are you as tired as I am? Yeah. All right, thank you guys. You've been a blessing, and uh, we'll see you guys later in the week. Uh, remember us in prayer for University of Minnesota and also Northwest, yeah? God bless you, thank you. Thank you.